So this chapter brought up some interesting questions, at least for me to think about, um, from an ethics standpoint. Um, um, and I think it's a lot of questions we're grappling with as a nation right now, um, as we, because some of these things become politicized and become used as political weapons, um, even though they're not really, they're not really unique to one group or party or, or you know, every party has had their sex scandals and their drug scandals but it becomes a weapon by one used against the other whenever they're trying, you know. And so when that happens, it makes it very hard for us to have frank discussions about what's appropriate and not appropriate and why. So um, so the first thing they call, the first section of this chapter they call, is there anything special about sex? That's what they call it in the book. Um, and... I, you know, if, if you're a libertarian, and I think a lot of us in this area of the country consider ourselves pretty libertarian, meaning we don't believe in that the government should have a big say in people's lives, people should be able to sort of do what they want as long as it's reasonably not impacting others. Most of us like that concept, at least. So if you're a libertarian, then you kind of have to reject all of these notions that we have about these issues. Like, what's wrong with sex and advertising? What's wrong with sex as a means of career advancement? If it's two consenting adults and one of them is using it not as a means of showing love or affection, but is using it as a means of advancing their career, What's the problem, right? Um, that it's a matter of individual freedom and then it's a matter of free markets. And if somebody is willing to pay that price at the market, then why shouldn't they be rewarded? And yet that tends to go against our, our historical feelings of what's right and what's wrong uh, in America as it relates to sexual relationships. So... What's wrong with it? What's wrong with using sex as a means to advance your career? Why is... What's more qualified mean? And is that... It is. That's the problem, right? But I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm trying to, to question you for the, for the sake of, of thinking about it. And I don't disagree with you, okay? Um, what is the basis upon which people should be promoted? Qualification? Meaning they can do the job better? Anybody ever not gotten a promotion because someone else less qualified than you got it? Doesn't feel fair. So he says it's not fair. What, what other reasons might there be, objections might there be to using sex as a means of advancing your career? Not everybody has what the boss wants. No, right? I mean, it depends on the the boss's uh, proclivities, and so that, that that again limits the the sort of fairness of that. Anything else? Nobody wants to go to the. Nobody wants to go to the. Uh, it's just wrong. Like, like it's morally wrong to to. I, I feel like we live in a in a community where that's probably the predominant feeling that using sex is, is wrong, but people are really reluctant to say that now. Why do you think as a society we're so afraid to say, hey, this thing's wrong? It's just morally wrong this, you know, to, to use sex as a, as a tool for it's prostitution and nothing else. But we have, we live in a society where people won't even say prostitution is wrong anymore because. It's because we have people like Lila that we saw 
Okay, so we do live in an era of political correctness, which means to make a value judgment on anything, it could possibly have you called out as a bigot, right? And we don't want to be bigots. I don't know why people are so afraid of being bigots, but we are. We don't want to be seen as prudish or bigoted. Um, like, I have a feeling if I privately surveyed you, that more than half of this class would say it is morally wrong to use sex uh, outside of a, a committed relationship for a me as a means to an end to get something out of it. Probably more than half of the people in here would say that privately, but we're reluctant to say it publicly, and I think that's an interesting place we're at in society. Um, so right now, in the news today, We've got a Supreme Court nominee, right? Anybody followed the story at all? So what's happening with him? A second allegation, again, back to high school days, right? So the first allegation, if you haven't been following, is so we have a guy who's been nominated to Supreme Court. He did a really great job in his confirmation hearings of sort of navigating the minefields he probably didn't help anybody who wasn't going to support him support him, but he also didn't break anybody who was going to support him, which is about what you can hope for as you navigate those questions. Looked like he was going to sail through on a party line vote. And then um, a woman says, hey, he, uh, he sexually assaulted me back when we were students in high school 35 years ago. His response? No, I didn't. Right? Like, what else can you say? You, you did it. No, I didn't. And that's like, that's about where, like, that's a tough place to be because, um, and then there was this whole issue of was she, is she willing to testify under oath to it? She didn't feel like the, the, the situation they were asking her to testify in was going to be fair to her because it was just going to be a he said, she said. Uh, of course, they come back with, of course, it's a he said, she said because you have no proof. And so it just makes this like really rough situation. And so they kind of came to terms on when she would testify. And then last night, boom, another woman says, oh, yeah, well, he did some stuff to me, too, back in high school. And he's saying, this is, this is, not, this is not true. This is a smear campaign. Someone's going out and finding people I went to high school with who have political leanings different than mine. And it just takes finding one or two people who are willing to say this. And I've got... I can't prove what happened 35 years ago or didn't happen. He's got another whole group of people, friends, women who knew him in school. They're like, this does not fit the character of the guy we knew at all. He was like a super nice guy. Okay, so how do we deal with this societally from an ethical standpoint when the mere accusation of something happening when you were a teenager could derail you from a Supreme Court nomination 35 years later? There's a part of me that's like, these women, if they were assaulted, deserve to be heard. And there's another part that's like, it's kind of insane that just accusing somebody could like destroy their whole career without any proof at all, just the accusation. What does this mean in that context? And then what does it mean in the broader workplace context? Yeah. Well, I don't think that if that happened 35 years ago, it should have any bearing on this time now, because if it was you, brought up. If, if there's an issue like that, it should be brought up immediately. Should, you know, I think should have to so does anybody have a, a counter argument for? Uh... So the first the, the first victim, I didn't mean to evict air quotes. She's a victim. The first victim says, the reason I didn't bring it up is I was a 15-year-old kid. I was at a party that I wasn't supposed to be at. I was drinking. My parents would have killed me. And I told myself, nothing happened. He scared me. He held me down on the bed. But then his friend broke it up. And so I told myself, I convinced myself at the time, nothing happened. So I'm just going to let this thing go. And then years later in psychotherapy, as she was exploring with her psychotherapist, 
why do I have these problems in relationships with men? It kind of resurfaced. Not like she'd forgotten about it and blocked it, but just it resurfaced and she realized that this event was a much bigger event in her life than she had allowed it to be. And so that's what she's saying. That's why I didn't report it then, but I'm reporting it now because as I see this guy elevated to a, a, a situation where he could be making decisions for our whole country, the thought of that is traumatic to me given what he did to me. That's that's uh, that's her rejoinder to your question. Despite that, she still should she had no excuse to have not brought that back then. Because bring it up in the moment, it could just be fake. So, you know, it, 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 you bring it up as it happens, and then there's a chance to do something. It, it is true, and that's what they're saying is that, that this would be. Uh huh. Okay. But recognize that, that sexual assaults are, are highly underreported. And that's partially because of, uh, of feelings by victims that they'll be victim shamed or that they'll be told it was their fault. What were you doing at a party where guys were drinking in your bathing suit? Of course that's going to happen to you, which is, which is bull crap, right? If that really happened, then she's legitimately a victim of an assault. No matter what she was wearing, that doesn't make it okay. But I agree with you, Chandler, in the sense that it makes it really hard to prove and, for him, unfairly hard to defend, too. Like, what can I do but say I, that didn't happen and show you a bunch of people who knew me and said he wouldn't have done something like that. And, of course, then their response is, well, just because he never treated you that way doesn't mean he didn't treat anybody that way. Um, I, the other, my other thought is, man, I did some stupid stuff in high school. And I did things that I'm not proud of today. And I probably, I, I never sexually assaulted a woman, but I have done things that, I did do things that were criminal. You know, we were messing around and, and that I don't know how fair it would be to, 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 to bring up my today self and compare it to that. And I don't know if it would be fair to, to judge my today's judgment, whether or not I could handle having good judgment today versus what I did at 17 or 16 years old. But that doesn't necessarily excuse the committing of the crime. So that's what makes this so muddy and hard. Did you have your hand up? Mm -hmm. True. So there is no statute of limitation on rape, murder, certain violent crimes. So if there were evidence, he could theoretically still be prosecuted. And that might make it different than my youthful indiscretions, right, of, I don't know, you know, shoplifting or something like that, where the statute of limitations is expired and there's no way I, that I could even be prosecuted as opposed to uh, an assault. Um, although she's not alleging rape, right? Um, she, so that that's, okay, so now let's try to take it away from the context of this very elite people in very elite circles talking about very elite things and move it into like a workplace. What does this current environment, sort of the hashtag Me Too environment, what does it mean for even normal relationships within a workplace? Like how do we, what do you think? Well, just thoughts on that and how do we deal with them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I won't go to lunch with my secretary, even though we're good friends, not alone. Her, her spouse and my spouse will go. Why? Because the mere allegation of something is destroying people's careers. I won't meet, if you've noticed any of my female students, if you come to my office, I say, why don't we go in the lab and work on this? You know, I, I, you know, because one student saying he, probably even he looked at me inappropriately, could be damaging to my career. 
So that's one piece of fallout from this movement. Have there been positive things about it, though, too? Does it put men on notice, maybe? Right. I think if you're just professional, it should be you know, rather than a one off. And so do I. I have to, right? Because I've got to get work done. And in my case, my secretary is female and my boss is female. And so I've got to like I've got to make sure that we have a professional relationship. Um but I will tell you, it's scary that the mere accusation is enough to destroy you now. It used to be there had to be proof. But we're in a climate right now that's like, if you ask someone for proof, it's like, you're shaming that victim. Well, no, I'm just asking them to substantiate what they're saying. But can you destroy somebody over something you can't prove? Should you be able to? That, that's a really difficult thing. All right. So some of the legal side of sexual harassment, the legal definition is that it's an unwelcome sexual advance. Unwelcome is a vague term because what, you know, how often do you hear people say, I, I, I thought what I was doing was okay. They seem to reciprocate, right? That does happen. In dating situations, it happens. And in work situations. To me, the easiest answer, guys, is just stay away from sexual things at work, whether or not it seems like it's welcome. That will keep you safe. You know, and if you want to have a sexual relationship with someone you work with, how about you don't? Like, uh, it, it becomes really complicated really fast. So there's two types uh, legally. One is called quid pro quo sexual harassment. What That's Latin, okay? Um, in essence, it means like tit for tat or in exchange for something like, like, hey, you know, you want to be promoted? Well, I've got a way for you to get ahead. Okay. That's the more overt type of sexual harassment, you know, uh, based on sort of either a promise of something in return for sexual favors or the imp implication of that. Okay. The second is what's called a hostile environment. That's where someone, just by their unwanted sexual advances or conduct, makes work a hostile or unpleasant place for another person to be. That one's tougher from a management standpoint. Because again, there's a lot of times people make jokes. I was in the military, guys. And like, it's like a boys club, I'm sorry. You know, there's just a lot of that sort of inappropriate joking and stuff that goes on. But, you know, we work together, males and females together, and at some point you're like, guys. Like, but then if you do that, guess what? You'll have females that will be like, how dare you not treat me like one of the guys? I object to the fact that you treat me different. So they want, like, they want to be in on all the raunchiness, but then as soon as they don't feel comfortable with it, now you've, you created a hostile work environment. So it's really a challenging thing, especially on a deployment where it's like, how do we do this? Well, the safest way is just to not do it at all, not talk about sexual things, make sexual jokes at all. I think I've told some of you, if you're in my legal environment class, about the time I was sexually harassed here at EAC, right? So it's not just men harassing women. It happens the other way around. Do anybody do remember this story? Right. So I'll tell you, this, this lady, she did not work at the college. She worked at one of our th third parties, like Gift, something like that. I don't remember where she worked. but So I'm there. I'm, like, I'm, I'm talking to a coworker over by fiscal control. And she walks up, and she says, she says oh, you're that guy with eight kids. Well, I'll tell you something. If my, if my husband looked like you, I'd have eight kids too. <laughs> and so like I was like, Okay, that was awkward, right? Like, but that was it. Like, I just let it like, go. Like, I thought she was trying to be funny or whatever. Like, sometimes people are trying to be funny, but it comes across as more, like, weird. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> Thanks, I guess, or, you know. Um, anyway, so I let it be. So then, like, then 
and this is in February, so like just a, like within a week of that, it's Valentine's Day, and she comes into my office and she has this little, you know what cloisonne is? It's like a little a cloisonne heart shaped box, and she brings it to me and sets it on my desk and says, "That's for you." And it's like, okay, like I'm married, I got eight kids, remember, like <laughs> that thing, like, like. So like that became awkward, and then she would like do like almost like little cat calls when she'd see me around, like, "Ooh, hey, you know, like, right?" And okay, just so you know, this doesn't happen to me very often, <laughs> uh, but she was into me for whatever reason, okay. Um, and it got to be where I felt really uncomfortable about it. So I went to I talked to my wife, and I'm like, "What? The, what do I do?" And she she thought it was funny. She laughed at me. <laughs> And just so you know, this woman was quite a bit older than me, too. Uh, and uh, so I went to my boss, and I'm like, I think I'm being sexually harassed, right? And guess what he did? He laughed at me. He was just like, you know, like, you know, lucky you, man. Like, so, you know, it's good to know you still got it. And like, and like, I would see her coming, and I would totally avoid her. Like, walk all the way outside of the building and go all the way around so I didn't have to be jeered at. And when I saw her coming, I'd feel sick to my stomach. <laughs> right? So clearly, that was a hostile work environment for me based on unwanted sexual advances. And management just blew me off when I tried to seek resolution. Like, I probably could sue the college. But I didn't because I thought it was more of an isolated thing. And in fact, she stopped working here and then it just went away. But... Do you think if it happened again, I would report it? No, I'd feel like they'd just laugh at me. And I think a lot of women just feel like that's what's going to happen. Although I think in this day and age, more often than not, it would be taken seriously just as a means, if nothing else, for the organization to protect itself from, from potential lawsuits and things like that. So what I'm telling you is, is like, and this story I just told you isn't made up for effect. It really happened. Like, you could be sexually harassed if you're a man. and and I simultaneously felt dumb that I even cared and felt sick to my stomach about it all at the same time. Yeah, probably and probably more often, right? Right. Did I do did I do something to to encourage this behavior? Or did it seem like I was interested? And then Right. And would you guess, even though I just said men can be harassed too, that it happens the vast majority of time in the other direction? Men harassing women, for sure. Okay. Right. But but look, so let me ask you something. Is there other times when a person, a man, in an, in a setting, touches you on the shoulder, and it seems more like a friendly gesture than a than a creepy sexual gesture? And that's what that's what makes this really hard sometimes, right? Like, like I'm kind of touchy, and I know, like, I'll come like help someone with their accounting, and I'll like I'll like put my hand on their back, right? And that and there could be one person that's like, oh, he's friendly, and another person that's like, Ugh. like, whoa, why are you uh, why are you touching me, right? Like, and that's another challenge with all of this is, um, and then there's like close talkers, the people that like are all up in your space. And again, some people just stand close, but some people are trying to brush up against you. And you're like, and it's, for some people it's sexual, and for other people it's just where they, that's like, they're, and you're like, are you not feeling what I'm feeling? I can't, I'm holding my breath because you're so close to me. I one time had a dude that he would, I would, I would back up, and he would like step closer to me, and I'd like back up, and he'd step closer. And finally he backed me into a wall, and I said, this was in a professional setting, I said, dude, 
if you don't take a step backward, I'm going to punch you in the face like that. And that was pretty effective, actually. Um, but like, <laughs> not if it's your boss, then you're like trying to like sidestep it, right? Like that. And that wasn't sexual. It was just like bubble zone, like stay out of my bubble zone. All right. So there's kind of two ways to look at um, some of these multicultural aspects. So you've got to recognize what seems as a sexual advance to some people is not to others. What is a norm in one community is different than a norm in another community. Brazil is a country that is pretty open about sexuality, uh, comparatively, compared to us. Saudi Arabia is a country that's very closed about sexuality. And we're probably on the further down the open end of the spectrum than most places in the world. Uh, you know, we, we don't mind dressing a little more provocatively here and we don't think someone's a terrible person if they, if they wear a short skirt uh, or if a guy wears a, you know, a muscle shirt that shows off his body more. We don't think of that as, as um, oh, they're a horrible person or, you know. So there's kind of two ways of looking at it. The first is what they call local deference, a local deference ethical strategy or the when in Rome do as the Romans strategy, which is when somebody moves to another area, say for work, that they're expected to sort of adopt the cultural mores of that place. So if you move here from Europe and what was acceptable in your workplace there is not acceptable here, then it's your job as the person who's come into this newer, this, this predominant culture to adjust your behavior to be appropriate there. But also, there's supposed to be this understanding of the people saying, this person's new here, we're not going to freak out about things that they do, they're a little weird to us. Europe has had tons of problems with Muslim immigrants who think that you have to recognize in some Muslim cultures, women are almost thought of as a property of their husbands, that who think it's okay if they like a girl to, to touch her. Um, and you can imagine how that flies in England, whose sensibilities are very similar to ours. Um, it's not flying good, okay? And there's a lot of, 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 you know, guys getting arrested for sexual assault who were like, I didn't mean it as an assault. I was trying to show her I liked her, right? So that's the one, is this local deference for ethical, uh, local deference ethical strategy. Give deference to the local rules of where you're at. I promise you, if you go to a Arab nation, you will be expected to follow their rules and their customs, which means you don't talk to a woman if she's not your family member or not, you know, I mean, you don't talk to her. A, you're going to get her in trouble, and, and, and B, you probably get yourself in trouble. The other is what they call a multicultural respect ethical strategy, which is when people come and have different uh, ethics about um, sexual and other things, we're supposed to be, as the hosts, understanding of their different views. So the fact that these are the two predominant ethical strategies for dealing with these things tells you a lot why we have a lot of problems, because they're, they're diametrically opposed. They're completely opposite of each other. One, in essence, says if you're the visitor, it's your responsibility to figure out the culture of where you're at and behave accordingly. The other says, if you're the host to visitors, you're supposed to be tolerant and, 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 and allow them to behave in ways that's not going to fly, right? Oh, you're from a country where it's okay to grope women? Go right ahead. No. You don't, you know, that's just not going to fly here. I mean, we just don't even talk about certain things in professional settings. It's not, you know, not appropriate. And then there's what they call a traditional perspective, which is, I don't give a crap what your values are, where you're from. Certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And we're not going to do wrong things, even if that's normal for you. That's the traditionalist perspective. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I still got a lot of that in me, beat into me by my grandparents. Right? I'm a sexist pig because... I still hold a door for a lady. That's what I was taught to do. I was taught that if a woman's carrying stuff that looks heavy for her, you go offer to carry it. <laughs> but not the same for a guy. Sexism, man. But that's how I was raised. Um, 
And so I tend to see someone making any sort of an unwanted advance toward a woman as something I'm going to get pretty protective and defensive about, right? Some guy talks to my daughter and I can tell she's not into it. I'm going to step into that pretty quick. And I may have a firearm. Okay. Um, not, you know. All right. So let's get, get uh, out of that topic and just really quick into drug use at work. So they give this definition, I don't know if everybody agrees with it, that a drug is a substance affecting the structure or function of the body or of one's consciousness. Okay, whatever. Um, by that definition, then, probably caffeine's a drug, right? Use of coffee or like Red Bull or energy drinks would be a use of drugs. Um, so here's the question. What's wrong with people using drugs at work? What's the problem? Okay, so that's a problem. You're driving the forklift while you're wasted. Might there be drugs that would improve your performance at work? Amphetamines or something like that? Oh, seriously. Adderall? Do you know that something like two-thirds of Major League Baseball players are taking Adderall. You know, you're like, yeah, make me a better hitter. Because it increases focus. And so, and because it's not a banned substance if they can be diagnosed as ADHD. And when you go to a doctor to say, I think I might be ADHD, all they do is give you a questionnaire. And you fill that questionnaire out, and they're like, yep, you have the symptoms. Let's try Adderall and see if this helps you. So it's super easy to get a diagnosis. And, and so in a, in, a, in a sport where being able to put the ball into play 25% of the time means you're not going to get hired, but being able to put the ball into play 30% of the time means you're one of the better hitters in the league, where the margins are that thin, they all want that advantage. And guess what? Their employers are complicit in this, in that... You know, they're, if not directly encouraging it, they're certainly looking the other way, saying, do everything in your power that's within the rules of the league to improve your play because you're going to be cut if you don't. So, how do we feel about drug testing? Anybody just completely opposed to it? Some people really don't like it. Nah. Depends on the job. What do you mean? So like for my job, I probably don't really need to be drug tested. Like I could be wasted right now. You wouldn't know. Right? They'd probably like me better. They'd be like, man, his lectures are awesome. Right? And he's always bringing chips and stuff, sharing them with us. Um, okay. So drugs that are, are or so jobs that are potentially dangerous, they might should be screening for drugs that could potentially add to that danger. How about uh, this? Not on, it's not part of the book, but you hear a lot of people talk about drug screening for welfare. It's a really popular thing on Facebook. Why do you think they really haven't gone there very much? Even though there's some part of almost every one of us that's kind of like, yeah. Yeah, you shouldn't be able to get welfare if you're using drugs. Was that a uh, an empirical probability? <laughs> or was that a, uh, wait, what was the other one called? Subjective probability. <laughs> and what was the subjective based on? Uh, no, why do, why do you think that that hasn't gotten more trans more traction. Okay. Is it an individual rights and dignity sort of mind mindset? I don't know if we have a right to welfare or not. That's a whole other debate, right? Does it seem pretty? I mean, how many of you have ever had to do a drug test? 
for a job or for some other reason? One, two, three, only three, four, counting me. Does it feel dignified? It's all warm. That doesn't seem very dignified, right? It doesn't seem like the way you treat somebody that you trust. And so if it's not the way you treat somebody that you trust, then clearly they don't trust you, right? And that doesn't make you feel great about it. I know. When I was in the military, I seriously, I was, I was deployed at their behest, not my own, overseas. Came back, got drawn for the random urinalysis test. And when you do urinalysis tests in the military, a senior officer has to see it leave your body to ensure that you're, so you have to be there in full view. It's real pleasant. Um, and of course, my senior officer happened to be a guy I went to church with who thought the whole thing was hilarious. He'd be like, drip, drip, drip. Come on, let's get this going. Um, and then, because I had been deployed for one that I had been randomly chosen for months before while I was on deployment, they decided there was a makeup. So two weeks later, I had to do it again. And I'm like, just dip the stick in the same freaking cup. Like, it's the same pee, I promise you. It did not feel very, like, like they cared about my dignity at all. Um, and so that's a real issue because the people I work with here, we have dignified relationships. In other words, we don't yell and scream at each other when we have a disagreement. We're collegial. We sit down. We work out challenges together. Um, we're expected to be professional. And that starts to feel outside of that realm. That's the problem with it. And so when we start saying, well, we don't want to do that for our coworkers, but we'll do that for people on welfare, it's almost like saying that's a group of people that are worthy of less dignity because of their socioeconomic status. And I think that's why people are like leery of it. Even though I think on its face, the idea that's like, hey, if you're going to be collecting welfare, you should show that you're not a drug addict. I think that resonates with a lot of people. And so it's, it's a challenging thing. So organizational facilitation of drug use. Some organizations are complicit, like I mentioned with Major League Baseball, with their people using drugs. Complicit means you know what's going on and you turn a blind eye. Maybe it's just like, hey, I don't, you know, what they do in their own time is their own business and I don't want to be involved. Or maybe it's even more nefarious than that, like I'm benefiting from their drug use. Um, they were, in the book, it talks about Amy Winehouse and all of her people who worked with her and they were watching her just spiral. But every time she would go on this drug-induced rampage, it would like generate all this interest and it would sell a bunch of records. And so her producers were actually profiting from the fact that her behavior was, was driving her brand of this kind of bad girl, right? Um, and so, again, ethically, we have to come back to this whole, is it outcome-based? And what outcome are we looking at? Or is it duty-based? Do I have a duty to intercede even if it's going to cost me a million dollars? Probably you do, right, when it's a person's life. Some workplaces go beyond being complicit and they're actually encouraging drug use. Um, I think professional sports would be a place we could look where there's some of that going on. You know, how many have heard of Lance Armstrong? Yeah, seven-time Tour de France winner, something like that. I don't know if it was seven, but like, you know, the most decorated cyclist ever. Um, and in essence, what he said is like, yeah, I was doping, but everybody dopes. That's not his boss, per se, that was encouraging him, but the nature of the contest is that everybody's dirty and you just singled me out. I don't know if that's true or not true. In essence, he's saying without doing the thing, I mean, they were doing crazy stuff. Like when you're doing these long distance endurance races, when you stop for the night, they, they like take your blood out and put another person's blood into you so you have fresh oxygenated blood to ride with the next day. Crazy crap. Using human growth hormone 
and all sorts of, you know, crazy stuff. And his his argument was like, like you could not win at this level if you weren't doing it. Like the whole organization is built upon the backs of us using these drugs. If that's true, then that's more than just complicit, complac you know, being complicit. And then there have been limited cases of even involuntary doping with like employers spiking people with drugs that they didn't even know they were getting. Okay, the U.S. government has done this. Uh, that's documented in test cases. You know, and again, with military people saying how... And that's all for this chapter. I, I, what I like about this chapter is it's kind of short, but it, like, there's a lot to think about in it. Because we have a lot of this going on in the world right now. And as long as we're going to have men and women, we're going to have sexual issues arise. Well, and men and men and women and women, right? I mean, as long as people are sexually attracted to other people, this doesn't go away. Some people choose to exercise those feelings in an appropriate way other people in inappropriate ways and then making it even harder is we don't all agree on what's appropriate and what's inappropriate what one person finds flattering another person finds offensive so that's a challenge I think the drug issue is a little more cut and dry except it's become less so right marijuana use has become I think there's like pretty large-scale support at this point for legalizing marijuana in a lot of places um, you know with arguments like it's safer than alcohol and uh, and it provides relief to people who have chronic conditions and, and things like that we, we've, we've really softened our thought on marijuana especially if you ever go YouTube check out a movie called reefer madness which like like extols the dangers of marijuana use and it's an old like 50s movie compared to today where everybody's like it's an herb, man. Makes you happy, man. What's the problem, man? Shaggy used it, and he was my childhood hero, man. Like that. Anyway, so these things don't go away. Have a great day. And, uh, well, I guess that's it. Just have a great day. <laughs>